could you imagine being such a fan of of something and yet know nothing about it right could like could let's just say you were a huge fan of um knitting sweaters right yet you had no fucking idea how to use a knit in some thread and make a sweater out of it right that's yeah. what the, that's what that's what the ownership of the bears is and f and for them to not know if you claim that you've grown up a fan and you're you're a fan of this team well damn it so am i dave ski paul ski just like you would expect george ha hallis have have had to only times a, a million right because he's the actual family member in, in on the team that's going to inherit it potentially that's a different story for a different day you would think that you would have some idea of how to run a football team and for all the all the years of just uh, bringing in um uh consultants and, and and it's just it's fuck it's pathetic for them to, for, to to not know anything about football having grown up with it to get to this point kevin warren was a mistake of a hire kevin warren we should have all we should not have been fooled by kevin warren being hired by the mccaskies because kevin warren if it comes down to kevin warren not wanting jim harbaugh on this team because of the issues that they've had before well to me they have a clash in values and kevin warren basically if you hear him talk to me he's just the preacher of hallis hall now he's always talking about he's always it's always like he's like preaching in church when you hear him talk he's not a football guy either because anybody that would that would pass on knowing that you're going to take caleb williams first with the first pick in this draft and stick with this lame duck coaching staff rather than bring in Jim Harbaugh. And if it took getting rid of Ryan Poles to give Jim Harbaugh that ultimate talent, well, then use your fucking brain and just do it. Pull the trigger and do it. What else do you have to lose? Why does it always have to be a yes man to the McCaskies? Why? Yeah, and you know what? We'll do the ping pong here because me and David go back and forth on this all the time, Shorty, all the time. And he feels i think a lot like you so i'll i'll be the guy on the other side of the court here um so if some billionaire comes in here do you all of a sudden have a football guy now in the front office no you still just have a businessman and at the end of the day that's what they're trying to be is businessmen and not football guys but that's that's most of the franchises that is most of the franchises these are multi-billion dollar franchise for me when i put it like percentage of blame on things ownership tends to get the least like the fact that you didn't have your guys ready on special teams is a trickle down effect from coaching. The fact that Caleb's out there, you know, getting sacked seven times, nine times, seven times again in three games this year, that's a trickle down effect from your GM not putting the proper talent on the field. Um, which is the a trickle fact, down from the ownership because well, well, the I, fact that that you don't move on from Eberflus, the only thing I could think of is right. financial. If you have them under contract and you don't want to pay two coaches at once, that is cheapness of the ownership then affecting football operations. I However, don't mean like, to interrupt you, but if they they interviewed interviewed Flus before they hired Ryan Poles, so then all of a sudden Ryan Poles he becomes his number one guy. Like to me, sure. you could have put him in the lineup of coaches and picked out Eberflus as the McCaskey guy. Sorry to interrupt you. So they did the first round of interviews. They hired Poles. And his choice was between the second round of interviews, which was Eberflus, Jim Caldwell, and Dan Quinn. Right? And yeah. I remember at the time thinking I would want Dan Quinn just because he's more experienced. Now, you know, I, I want to tell you, like, John Fox, in my opinion, was the last real coach we had. A lot of people give him shit because of the results of the seasons, but it, he, honestly, he was yeah, he came shit. he came off of a Super Bowl appearance team where they got embarrassed. He went up to ownership and was pissed because he can't run his offense. It's Peyton Manning's offense. I'm just here as a defense guy, and he left a Super Bowl appearing team. I think one of the only coaches to do that to come here and do what overturn a locker room in three years, and that's exactly what he did. He replaced almost everybody in three years and he did it with a smile and then retired. And I've always had said, you know, hats off to that guy. 
because he came in here and did his job, and it was here for that reason and that reason only. However, under him, what did you get? You had Adam Gase get a head coaching opportunity. Why? Because he all of a sudden fixed Jay Cutler. You had Vic Fangio here left from John Fox. Why? Because this is an experienced coach towards the end of his tenure in the league. He knows guys. He knows staff members. Okay? This isn't his first time around the damn block. And that was my issue with Eberflus. It's like, okay, so you're promoting Luke Getze from quarterback's coach to offensive coordinator, never done it before. Okay, Shane Waldron's out there. Anybody can get him. Like, you don't have an established philosophy. You don't have established coaches. You're firing coordinators left and right. There, there's a lot more issues than what just what's going on the field. And that's why I really wanted a guy like Jim Harbaugh. I, I didn't even care if people thought he was good or not good or liked him or didn't like him. I don't care. I was like, he will bring a legitimate staff in here, turn the culture around, which is exactly what the Chargers players are saying right now. Our culture has been turned around. We love Jim Harbaugh. We'll take a bullet from him. They're 10 weeks in. Yeah, but when it comes to ownership, I mean, in my opinion, that there are plenty mistakes on every level leading up to ownership. And I think ownership is the least likely to change because it's at the top level. And when you look around the league, I mean, I there's plenty of examples of worse owners that have won. Tampa Bay's ownership is not very good. You know why they won? They went out and got Tom Brady and Bruce Arians. Dave. I'm going to try to work my way back to what everybody was kind of addressing. So the Kevin Warren thing to me, Shorty, I mean, it took me about, I think me and Paul talked about this. I was like, ah, there was some hope there. I think within six months, I knew what this guy was here for. And it was purely for stadium building. The only things on his resume were managing the Big Ten. And it's not because he was a football guy. It's because when you manage like 10 schools, you're not a football person. You're not a sports person. You're a business person, right? So you're managing the, the inner workings of the business relationship. So that was never, a, to me, indicative of him being like a football dude just because he managed a football 10 program. Two, he was not in charge of the Minnesota Vikings by any means. As soon as they built Target Field, he was out. Why? Because he was there for one reason, one reason only. Build that fucking stadium and go away. Because he was never involved in football operations. Because the Minnesota Vikings, if you look at them in the last 10 to 15 years, have they looked different in any way? They always find one or two spectacular players kind of stay consistent, stay good, good coaching staffs, you know, just kind of those things. So I never really expected much from Kevin Warren to address maybe what Shorty was kind of thinking. So in that way, I don't – I put – most of this to me guys honestly he's just not relevant in this he he's uh he's by name only a guy that you're supposed to run paperwork through but i think you can literally remove him from the hierarchy of like who reports to who and nothing really changes i truly believe that because even in the background of like hard knocks we saw him he got a packet of paperwork hey we're gonna do this with dj Moore, and he goes flips it three times looks good to me because he's just, you know, that's what his job is. It's almost like he's a delegator from on behalf of the McCaskies. But there's just like, it's just a way for George to say he's not involved, but still be involved by proxy. So that's how I feel about that. Um, two, you're talking about people being business people, Shorty, about like, you know, the McCaskies treating it like a business and stuff. Business is business. The biggest obstacle that the McCaskies have always had with their business is they take everything and do everything personally. There are no decisions I can name in the last, and let's just be, let's keep this recent with George with since 2012, when he took over as chairman or whatever, there's never been a non-personal decision. Everything is always personal or it's personal in the way of affecting your personal pocketbook. George Lovey was boring and he was respectful and I'm watching these teams over here be innovators and offensive geniuses. So I'm going to get an offensive genius. So you know where I'm going to go for that guy, Canada. And so Getting Mark Trustman walks right in a move. room debatable, but sure. I'll take, I'll give you that one. Um, but then he goes to Mark Trustman and Mark Trustman makes him mistake. feel smart. That's what he does, right? He, he walks Arians in and guy, yeah, yeah, but Bruce Arians go walks in there. He doesn't make you feel smart. He makes you feel dumb. He makes you feel dumb because you, you don't know football like he does. He tells you what needs to happen. Uh, what is it? Chris Ballard walks in and he makes you feel dumb because he tells you what you're doing wrong and what needs to happen for your team to be successful and better. And that hurts George's feelings. So he's going to take a guy like Mark who walks in there 
Mark Trestman makes him feel special and cool and smart, and he hires him. And then he he takes that that personally. And he took it personally so much that Mark Trestman made me look stupid and he set us back. So I'm going to go to the most stable, most lovey-esque thing I can go to, John Fox. And then John Fox is boring. So I'm going to go to Matt Nagy and Matt Nagy hurt my feelings again. So now I'm going to go to something boring and go to Eberflus because he's nice and he's respectful. And that's why next coaching cycle, you're going to end up with, you won't get Ben Johnson because he's too expensive and he'll probably tell you to go fuck yourself, George, and you deserve it. But you're not going to hire him because he's going to tell you what you've been doing stupid. You're not going to take somebody like, I don't know, Vrabel. Vrabel's not going to walk in here and take your shit. You're not going to get Stefanski because Stefanski knows what he's doing. You're going to get some check. You're not going to get anybody. You're going to get third or fourth most popular offensive coordinator candidate on the board, or you're going to get like Lincoln Riley, and it's going to be a catastrophe because, and I've been saying this for like three weeks, we're going to get Lincoln Riley. That's what's going to happen. We're going to give him a payday. He's going to get an upgrade. And yesterday, Caleb in his press conference is like, what do you do during this, all this adversity? Well, I call Lincoln and he tells me to just keep going. And I'm just, and I was like, that's it. There it is. It's right. Fuck it. George heard that and goes like, who, who do you call Lincoln? Let's get him. And that's, that's how I just feel about it. The meddling is, it's going to be what it is. Um, and, And this year I just had the expectations that, we could overcome the adversity of our own coaching staff. But this season, I think, is teaching a lot of people that coaching fucking matters. It matters so much. And the reason I'm so mad about this year is because it was so avoidable and the writing was on the wall and we all saw it coming. And now the things he does bad are overwhelming what any good he could provide you. So I think that's... The, the reason I'm I'm finding it hard to watch games and come on here and talk about this stuff over and over is because this season's lost. It's a oh, waste of time. It's gone. It, it's gone. It was gone two, three weeks ago. It was gone after Texans and me and Paulie's brain. We were done after the Texans game. Definitely gone. Because we just – Well, the Texans created a blueprint for every other team that they did wind up using more recently about how to get Caleb be, to be, be uncomfortable. Blitz and what did we, we said there was there was no fixing what the Texans Correct. did mid season. It's a and that's why we were just like we were just like this is done. You can't overcome this. Yeah, you and, have an uh, obvious flaw, an obvious flaw that's extreme, and and people are going to take advantage of it. And uh, I think right. Tom uh, is it Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown came in, and he just demonstrated to me how inept and incompetent professionals are so like shorty's talking about people who are hobbyists and they suck at it imagine sucking at your job this hard this is your fucking job and the fans are screaming at you what to fix and the fans and dumbasses of chicago are telling you what you're doing wrong and how to fix it easily and within four days thomas brown fixes it because i don't think whenever you use like a 31 out of 32 i think thomas brown did not have a top five offensive coordinator performance but he was like 18. He was a solid, the 20th best coordinator in the league yesterday, maybe 20th. And that would have been good enough to win you two more games so far this season. And we've been screaming about the things to change and improve and he couldn't do it. And so you ignored it and uh, that, or you were just so stupid and overwhelmed by it that you didn't know how to fix it, which is maybe a worse problem. 